Hallelujah. Well, I, I'm excited about the word. I, I've got just a little bit to share tonight, and, and this, is my, this is my word to you. Here it is. Expect the extraordinary. That's my whole message right there. Write it down. It'll serve you well. Here it is. Here it is. I'll say it again. Expect. Everybody say expect. expect. Yeah. Expect means it's going to happen. It's coming. I know it's going to happen. You, you know, when you talk about a lady that, that's going to have a baby, you say she's expecting. You know what? That baby's coming. It's going to happen. It's not just wishing upon a star. No. Expectation in the biblical sense is it is going to happen in my life. I think we need to expect the extraordinary. I think the extraordinary should be ordinary. I think the uncommon should be common. I think the supernatural should be natural. Come on, say amen. Don't you believe it? Glory to God. I was reading a great book. It got me so stirred up and excited. It was written about uh, 13 years ago now, back in 2000. It was written by Jerry Seville. Have you ever heard of him? He's an awesome guy. He's an awesome guy. Wouldn't it be great to have Brother Jerry come here and preach a little bit? I think it would be great. Brother Jerry wrote a book, and it was called Expect the Extraordinary Thinking in the Image of Christ. It's a great title, isn't it? It's a good book, too. Anybody ever read it? Expect the Extraordinary. You don't have to read it now because I'm going to tell it, tell it to you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I just saved you a book cost. Praise God. Thinking in the image of Christ. You know, Jesus had no problem thinking. Jesus had his thought life all worked out. It was faith upon faith upon faith upon faith. You know how Jesus looked at things? I'll tell you exactly how Jesus looked at miracles. Jesus looked at miracles as light-piercing darkness. It's as simple as that. Just flicking on the light. When he would heal somebody, in John 9, he healed somebody that needed their sight. He healed the blind man. And you know what he said? I've got to do the Father's work. I am the light of the world. In other words, healing was the Father's work. But what did healing, how did Jesus look at healing? How did Jesus look at a miracle? Nothing more than light being turned on in darkness. That's as simple as it was to him. Light being turned on in darkness. When I go home and I flick the light on in the living room, I fully expect light will vanquish the darkness. It's that easy. Just flicking the switch changes everything. Faith changes everything. The Word of God changes everything. Thinking right changes everything. A proper worldview changes everything. Moving in the Spirit changes everything. The anointing of the Holy Ghost changes everything. Hallelujah. So there's no reason that we should not expect the extraordinary if we're thinking right. Jesus did it all the time. That's the plane in which he operated he operated beyond measure and without limit. He was never stumped. He was never overcome. He was never outwitted. He never lacked authority. He never lacked ability. He was always in charge. Every room that he was in, he was the smartest guy in that room. Whatever realm he was in, he had absolute authority over that realm. If it was the realm of nature, calming the sea, peace be still. If it was the realm of the dead, raising the dead, Lazarus come forth. If it was opening ears or blind eyes or strengthening legs or whatever it was, he always had the authority. Why? Because he operated without limit. He just thought right. Can I put it that way? He just thought right. He expected the extraordinary in his life all the time. And I think we should too. Come on, say amen. amen. In his book, Jerry said that he received this word from the Lord back in 1999. He says, and, I, and this is it verbatim, beginning, this is what the Lord spoke to him, and I think it still applies. 
This is what the Lord spoke to Brother Jerry in 1999. Beginning in 1999, I will do for you what you've tried to do in yourself but could not do. Do you think that still applies? I will cause to come to pass those things which you've strived for and tried to accomplish in your own strength and in your own might, but just could not make them happen. Does this still apply? I will bring them to pass for you. Extraordinary things will become the norm in your life. So be it unto me, Lord. I said, so be it unto me, Lord. The extraordinary things to become the norm in your life. Things that never happened to most people in a lifetime will happen to you in one year's time. It's time to expect the extraordinary. Extraordinary means, by definition, beyond the common order, beyond the common method, beyond the common course of things. Notice the key there is beyond and common. Beyond the common. I'll tell you about common. Common is so common that we get comfortable with it. And there's a lot of common things that we become comfortable with them that we enjoy in our life. I mean, commonly, we enjoyed getting uh, paid. Come on, say amen. amen. Commonly, we, we get a paycheck, and, and so we, we enjoy that. But why, though that may be comfortable, and that may be what happens commonly, it can also be what limits us. Because why should we be limited to a paycheck? Is that all God can do for us? Is that the very most that God can do for us? It may be common, and it even may be comfortable, but it can be so limiting what would happen if we started to believe God to say, hey, you can do more than my paycheck? You may commonly get a certain gas mileage in your car, and that may be great. But hey, what if we believed God that our cars would go farther on the same amount of gas? It would be extraordinary, but wouldn't it be great? You may say, for my age, I feel pretty good. I mean, for a guy my age, it's common that, that, you know, I feel really good. But wouldn't it be great if God renewed our youth as the eagles? Wouldn't it be great if we were not limited by what was common for everybody else? But we operated commonly in the extraordinary, beyond the word means beyond the common order, beyond the common method, beyond the common course of things. Is anybody getting excited about this? What if you, like Christ, what if you, thinking with the mind of Christ, what if you operated on a different level than what was common for the rest of the world? What if people looked at you and said, wow? What if people looked at you and said, I've never seen anything like that before in my life? What if people looked at you and said, what are you doing, man? I mean, I, I got to know what vitamins you're on. I, I got to know who's your financial counselor. I got I to know where you're getting your gas. Come on, say amen. 
Uh, wouldn't you like to live at that level, the extraordinary level, the, the beyond the common level? Wouldn't you like to live at that level, that level of blessing, where God begins to do things in your life that's not common for everybody else, but you've got a higher level of faith, you've got a higher level of believing, you've got a higher level of receiving. You're, you're living in that extraordinary level, where the extraordinary is the norm for you. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. What if a bank loan officer called up a church and said, hey, what are you guys doing over there? What? Hey, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Hallelujah. I, I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if a, if a $1.2 million property sold for half a million dollars and that half a million dollars was paid off in 13 months. Wouldn't that be something? I said, wouldn't that be something? Glory! Who can explain that? I can't explain that. I mean, I'm working the checkbook and I can't explain it. All I can say, it's uncommon. It's extraordinary. It's God. Hallelujah. It's God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He told Jerry two things. Extraordinary things will become the norm in your life. And then he said, it's time to expect. Everybody said expect. expect. Say expect. expect. That's an awesome word. Say expect. expect. It's time to expect the extraordinary. Expect means to regard as going to happen. Man, we got to change our thinking around, don't we? We got to change our thinking around to say, hey, this thing's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, this thing's n not couch our words. or I mean, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You might be saying right now, my healing is going to happen, glory to God. You might be saying, my raise is going to happen, glory to God. You might say, my prodigal child is going to come home, glory to God. You might say, this marriage is going to work out, praise the Lord. You might say, come on, somebody, get some faith in this house. I'm telling you what, why not proclaim that the extraordinary don't get washed away in the common don't settle for the common don't settle for the ordinary don't settle for the best this world has to offer don't settle for nothing no lack no limit no loss don't settle don't settle praise the lord debbie and i have a mission in life it's getting you to believe that when Jesus died on the cross for you, he made you a joint heir. That means no lack, no limit, no loss. We have a mission in life to get you to think with the mind of Christ. No lack, no limit, no loss. That you are an overcomer. That you are a tree planted by rivers of living water. Your leaf does not wither, but you do bring forth fruit in due season. And everything you put your hand to prospers. I declare over you, you are more than a conqueror. You're on the winning side, glory to God. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, you know why we, we struggle with high expectations? is because of what happened yesterday and the day before and 10 years ago and a lifetime ago something didn't work out and it got the believer our believer turned off and well I can't believe now because I tried it before it didn't work out before so I, I can't do it now but in Isaiah 43 and 18 let's put that up there Isaiah 43 and 18 I'm gonna read from the amplified version Isaiah 43 and 18 says do not earnestly remember the former things you know, there's some stuff you just got to let go of. Don't remember them. Why? Because they're messing up your thought process. They're hindering you. They're holding you back. But they're former. Neither consider the things of old. Don't even consider them. 19, verse 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. I said God is doing a new thing. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. 19, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? 
hey, we got to give heed to the right thing. Amen. Don't give heed to your circumstance. Don't give heed to all the, the doubt and dismay and unbelief and, and skepticism and criticism and junk that the world has. Hey, they're unbelievers. That's why their words are full of unbelief. Don't let them cling to you. They're scoffers and they're critics. And hey, so their, their words are full of, of scoffing. Is that a word? There's, it is now. That's right. Thank you. She's a good preacher's wife. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't let, them get, don't let that stuff get on the inside of you. Praise God. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Say, yes, you are, Lord, yes, you are, Lord. in my life. Yes, so give heed to the new that God is doing in you because we need to raise our faith and we need to expect the extraordinary to become the new norm in our life. I, I truly, I really do. Debbie and I talk about this all the time. We truly do expect the, what the world would consider the extraordinary to be the norm in this church. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> Hallelujah. We believe every church service is going to be awesome. We believe every time God's people gather together that Jesus is going to show up, that something's going to happen. When I was praying for you earlier that you are the healed of the Lord and I was speaking over you, you know what was going on the inside of me? I believed it. I believed it because it's God's Word and it's God's will. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to Matthew 9 and 27. Matthew 9 and 27. This is such an exciting passage. I hope you get it. Hope you brought your Bible with you. If not, use your neighbors. Matthew 9 and 27. Then when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Wow! What a word! Do you believe I am able? That's our biggest hurdle right there. Do you believe I am able? Do you believe I am able? That, that's, the, that's it right there. Do you believe God is able? I mean, do you, are you deeply persuaded that what God said he would do, he will do it, glory to God. Romans 4, talking of Abraham, that Abraham was deeply persuaded. And Romans 4 and 17 says, this is strong faith, that Abraham was deeply persuaded that what God said he would do, he would do. I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, tipping the, of the hat to the will of God. I'm not talking about just acknowledging. I'm talking about a, a heart shift, a deep persuasion that what God said, I believe it. I know it. It's the truth in my spirit that what God said he would do, he is going to do. So Jesus asked them, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe you are. I know you can do it. I believe you can do it. So then he said in verse 29, he touched their eyes and he said, according to whose faith? Your faith. He pulled them in. He reeled them into his world. He reeled them into his way of thinking. He reeled them in. He said, do you think I can do this? Yes, sir, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. He says, that's it. Now you're a part of me. Now you're a part of the way I think. Now you've just lifted up into a realm of extraordinary thinking that you believe I can turn the light on in darkness. You believe it? Yes, sir, I believe it. Great. Then according to that faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, let it be. You know, in the beginning when God created everything, he said, let there be, and there was, and it was good. Let there be light, and there was light, and it was good. Let there be, let there be. Now, the same creative power. Faith has that creative power. You know, God operates in perfect faith. When he says something, it will be manifest. Let there be, and there was, and it was good. God, Father God has perfect faith, never lacking. God never uttered anything that did not happen. He's just trying to get us into that same realm of thinking. 
And so he phrases the word, he phrases it, the faith should be phrased in that same creative power according to your faith, let it be, and it was, and it was good. Anybody getting this? All right. Do you believe I'm able? Yes, Lord, I believe you're able. According to your faith or according to your level of expectation, let it be unto you. Now, I don't use the message version a lot, but here it is in the message because there's a little, there's a little revelation I want you to get. Verse 27, Matthew 9. And Jesus left the house. He was followed by two blind men crying out, Mercy, Son of David, mercy on us. When Jesus got home, the blind men went in with him. Jesus said to them, Do you really believe I'm able to do this? Or do you really believe I can do this? They said, Why, yes, Master. Verse 29. He touched their eyes and said, Become what you believe you know what you will absolutely you are what you believe you know you, you've heard you know your mom says you, you are what you eat well a higher revelation of that is you are what you believe what you believe governs your life but really, what you believe is who you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Become what you believe. Well, they became sighted. They became what they believed. What you expect and believe is what you become. So indeed, it is our mission then to raise our expectations. It is our mission then to raise our level of faith. If the Lord is, if the Lord is right, and He always is, if you become what you believe, isn't it our mission then to raise our level of belief? Because I want to become something deeper, wider than I am right now. More spiritually significant than what I am right now. More meaningful in the kingdom of God than what I am right now. I want to become, so I want to increase my belief. Turn with me to Acts chapter 3. In verse, went, in verse 1, I'm going to start winding it down now. But, but if, you, if you've gotten some of what I said, I want you to say amen. amen. Okay. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Because it's, it's not all about uh, what we are becoming. It's what we are becoming, how it affects uh, what's around us, the influence we have on what's around us. It's not just about my transformation. It's about me uh, expanding the cause of Christ in the world today. As a citizen of the kingdom, I want to be like the king, but I want to expand his kingdom as well. I want to be a witness. Come on, say amen. Okay, so Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now, this is a very familiar passage to most. It's about the healing of the man at the, at the gate, beautiful. But listen to some of these key words here. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of those who entered in. This man uh, had been at this gate his entire life. He's been asking alms his entire life. This was from the time of his birth that he uh, needs a healing. And so this was his common life. This was what was common for him. He would sit at the gate. His means of income would be asking alms. And uh, he got what he got. That was his common existence, his life. Now, verse 3, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked them for alms. That's what he commonly did. And fixing his eyes on him uh, with John, Peter said, look at us. And so he gave them his attention. Now, I would have to imagine that he asked so many people so often for alms that he probably didn't even lift his eyes. He, he probably just had his head bowed, his, his hand out, 
and just asked everybody generally as they were going by. So, so Peter had to, had to reel him in, just like Jesus had to, had to reel them in. Do you believe I'm able to do this? He had to pull him into his realm, his way of thinking, into his level of faith. And so Peter says to him, uh, fixing his eyes on him, Peter knew something spiritually is going to happen. That word fixing is very significant in the, in the original language. It, it, he is attaching himself to this fellow who's asking the alms. And so Peter knows the Lord has spoken to Peter. You know, Jesus walked by this man many times and did not heal this man, but this was this man's moment. This was it. This was this man's moment. The Spirit has spoken to Peter, and Peter fixed his eyes on him, and he said, look at us. Verse 5, and he gave him his attention, expecting, everybody say expecting, expecting. to receive something from them. He, he, he knew he was going to get something. He expected to receive something. What he received was different what he, than what he was expecting. He was expecting to receive what he commonly received from people, money. That's what he was expecting to receive from him. He was going to get something different, but he was expecting something common. Peter had to lift his level of expectation. The Holy Spirit is trying to lift our level of expectation. The Holy Spirit says, hey, you're, you're right here. And if he gave you silver and gold, that would have been a good day. That would have been a fine thing. That, that would have been what you commonly get. And wouldn't that have been comfortable? And wouldn't that have been, been wonderful? But hey, there's something better. There's a higher level. There's a greater blessing. There's something even better that can come into your life today. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Now, what did he have? What did Peter have? He didn't have the silver and gold the fellow wanted. He had something better than that. What did he have? He had the expectation that in the name of Jesus Christ he would be healed. Why did he have that expectation? Because he had the authority of the name of Jesus. Because he had experience in the healing ministry. Because he had the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Because he had the Word of God. He had the will of God. He knew what God's will was. He had just preached to 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost. He was moving in the Holy Ghost. He could not be denied. And he said, I've got something great on the inside of me and I'm willing to give you what I got. I want you to know that God is willing to give you what he has but what are you expecting to get from him yeah. hallelujah. hallelujah he'll give you whatever you're expecting just what are you expecting what are we expecting hallelujah because you get whatever he has hallelujah Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked, entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. We used to sing that song. He was walking and leaping and praising Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. All the people saw this. It was his blessing, but everybody saw it. And they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the be beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. He was expecting to receive something common. And what he received was beyond the common. And he started running and praising and giving God the glory. And the people saw it and they knew something uncommon had happened in their midst. Verse 10, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. It's not just for you. I said, it's not just for you. Why does God want to bless you? Well, he loves you. You're his child. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. But it's not just for you. You're blessed to be a blessing. Our life is a witness. Our life is a witness. I said our life is a witness. When this building is paid off, and we are a debt-free ministry from here on out, when this building is paid off, that is a witness for the body of Christ. 
That is a witness for the body of Christ. Do you not think that our loan officer is going to share with other churches that come in for a loan to say, hey, you know what could happen for you guys? Uh, same thing. It happened to that church down the road. God can do the same thing for you. God, every time God heals you, touches you, prospers you, blesses you, advances you, favors you, that's a witness to the world. That, I said that's a witness to the world. We need to be running and leaping and praising God because the whole world is watching. I said the whole world is watching. Are we showing them just the common stuff? Are we showing them just the run-of-the-mill, mediocre stuff? Or are we showing them how extraordinary our God is? Jesus said to the man, do you believe I can do this? And he said, yes, Lord, I believe. And Jesus said, okay, become what you believe. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me? Hallelujah.